Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and thanks, as always, for tuning in, and we'll get right to the work at hand this morning. Continuing our reading and discussion of this little book entitled The Origin of Futurism and Des- uh, and uh, uh, Preterism, and this is the second portion of the book, uh, which is entitled The Tragic Aftermath of Futurism. Futurism, which has become the orthodox teaching in the churches today, is a lie. It's part and parcel of the Jesuit-led counter-reformation to destroy Protestantism, to destroy the Bible, and to deceive the whole world, and that it has done. Myself included, as many times as I've confessed on this uh, on this broadcast, uh, for the most of my life I was futurist in my belief. I now know that to be diabolical lie. Futurism was a, a trick of the Jesuits to deceive the Protestants, to exonerate the papacy from the onus of Antichrist, and uh, and uh, literally has deceived the whole world and pitted uh, God's own people, his very elect, against God himself. That's what it has done. That's what it has accomplished. To deceive the very elect, that's what Rome's purpose was. And uh, I uh, believed in futurism for most of my life, and uh, God has corrected me and reconciled me. For that, I'm eternally grateful. Now, yesterday... Despite what the churches, or rather last week, Friday, rather than to reiterate the lies that are taught in the churches, that about the rapture, the secret rapture of the saints, we learn from the scripture, despite what is taught in the churches, we learn from the scriptures that Christ is coming not to rapture out his saints, but to destroy the wicked to judge and destroy the wicked, and to take his inheritance, the earth, and to make us joint heirs with him in his inheritance. That means we're staying. The wicked are going, not the righteous. We're staying. We inherit the earth with Christ. Now, that's not what they teach in the churches. They teach we're all going to be raptured out to heaven, see? And uh, uh, but uh, that's not what's going to happen. Now we're dealing with these false predictions that are attached to futurism. But before we continue our discussion about these false uh, predictions, we're going to see what Jude said. The writer Jude gives us the purpose for which the Lord returns. He says, "Quote." to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude 15. So it's not about a rapture, it's about a judgment. That's what Christ is returning for. The purpose of the Lord's return is to exercise judgment on the wicked, to remove the tares from the wheat. It's the tares that are going away to be burned. The Bible teaches that there will be just one future glorious, physical, visible, and audible coming of the Lord. Number one, to execute judgment on the ungodly, and two, to be glorified in his saints. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10. Now, what about these false predictions? What do the preachers of the churches teach? Among all the hype that is generated as a result of the prophetic theory of futurism are false predictions and vain speculations. The false predictions concerning the time of the rapture is nothing new. Men who claim they had special knowledge and insight into the future have mustered a devoted group of followers around themselves and have felt safe in making outlandish predictions. Their predictions, they are only bold to 
preach these outlandish predictions, that is the rapture, because they have surrounded themselves with followers. Okay? Had they no followers, they would not be so bold to predict these false predictions. If they had no followers, those who are now following them would be following the Scriptures and would be opposed to them, and they would not be so bold to predict these false predictions. The answer is to return to historicism. And you'll find this vast, uh, this vast following of the futurist belief return to historicism and would put these false prophets to flight. That's what we expect to happen. As the truth gains ground among the believers and, and futurism is abandoned and historicism is restored, these people who are so bold to predict these false predictions will soon disappear. That is, if we return to historicism. Now, what is this vast group of followers that surround these false prophets? Literally, all the churches, all, all the Christians. They've made these false predictions the orthodox teaching of the churches. So when you go to a church, no matter what denomination, you're going to hear these lies, these futurist lies. So what's the logical answer? Get out of the churches. Satan has sought to deceive God's people. And where would Satan expect to find God's people all gathered together so that he might deceive them? In the churches. And that's where it's taking place. Okay, Just like the religious leaders of Jesus' day. The religious leaders were apostate. They had made the people of Israel their servants imposing upon them prohibitions for, number one, reading the prophecy of Daniel to ascertain the, coming, the timing of the coming of Messiah, and passing ordinances and laws that were against the people. In other words, held them spiritually bound to the religious leaders of their day. Not to the law of God, but to the laws of men. That was the problem. They had replace God's law with man's traditions, man's laws, man's customs. Okay, the religious leaders of Jesus' day had literally set aside God's law to keep their own traditions, to enforce their own laws upon the people and to bind the consciences of men and women to them rather than to God. <coughs> so now... If a Jew or an Israelite would have found himself in violation of one of these laws, what did the law require? That they brought sacrifice. Right? So the priests of, of the religious leaders of Jesus' day were literally receiving sacrifices for the people from the people for violating their laws, not God's laws. See what I'm saying? Now, did Christ die to redeem us from the sin of breaking man's laws, which are no laws at all? You see how they had hijacked the true worship of God and made themselves gods? Had made themselves gods and had made the people all followers of themselves rather than, rather than Christ? Same thing has happened today. The very exact same thing has happened today. We now become servants of the priest and the priesters who impose upon us burdens too burdensome to bear, binding our consciences to rules and regulations, laws and principles for which God did not author. And they have hijacked the faith. And they have taught us lies. Lies about a rapture, a secret rapture, and a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. They've literally captivated and enslaved the entire Christian world. And it's time to be liberated. And that liberty is found in historicism. 
Okay, returning to the true word of God, rightly dividing the word of truth. And if we rightly divide the word of truth, we put things in their proper order, we come to the stark realization that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled completely and perfectly by Jesus 2,000 years ago. And the future fulfillment, the future 70th week of Daniel that we hear so often about in the churches is a lie. It is wrongly dividing the word of truth. And the purpose of that is to lead us all to worship and obey a false Christ. And that false Christ is the one that was heralded by all Bible-believing Christians from the first century right up until the early 1800s. It is the papacy. Plain and simple. Now, the false predictions concerning the time of the rapture is nothing new. Men who claim they had special knowledge and insight into the future have mustered a devoted group of followers, that is, today, the whole Christian world, around themselves, and have felt safe in making outlandish predictions. This even includes the papacy. Were it widely known and accepted, as it was in centuries past, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, would the papacy feel safe in even leaving his domains in the Vatican to make public appearance anywhere in the world? Likewise, his false prophets, his false futurist prophets, if we all return to historicism, the historical belief of the true Bible-believing Christians, neither would the papacy feel safe in leaving the Vatican, but neither would these false prophets feel safe in appearing in public, because they'd be shouted down by the vast majority of Bible-believing Christians. Okay? So we, we, when we abandon historicism and we accept futurism, we put the truth in an extreme state of minority status in the world. The truth is the minority of the world. Very, very few, as a percentage of the human population, still believe in historicism. They believe these false predictions, these false futurist lies. And we find all of these having originated from the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? The prediction, says the author, of the timing of the coming of Jesus to, quote-unquote, snatch away his bride, unquote, have ranged from 1844 to the present. Now, take note of the date, 1844. What do you know took place in 1844? Well, this author is very polite in not naming that great error that took place in 1844. But I'm not so careful. I want to tell you flat out who it is. It's the Millerite movement, out of which came the Jehovah Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists. Okay? They taught and believed that in 1844 Jesus would return. That was the basic tenet, the basic belief of these two groups, which were one group in 1844 since came into a controversy amongst themselves when Christ did not visibly appear in 1844, and they divided. They, re they both remain in error, grievous error, and I'll speak specifically to the Seventh-day Adventists, of whom I am oftentimes accused of being a member of them, simply because I hold to the Seventh-day Sabbath. But... What the Seventh-day Adventists did in order to save face in the world when Jesus did not physically return in 1844, they simply said that in 1844 he did return in the Spirit, much like Hymenaeus and Philetus said, right? He did return in the Spirit, but now he's involved in what, is, what they believe to be the investigative judgment. Okay, Jesus is busy going through the books, judging all the people. But what did Jude just say in the Bible? 
The purpose for the Lord's return is, quote, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches and ungo that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude 15. That's what he's going to do when he returns. But the, Jeho but the, but the Seventh-day Adventists say he's doing that now. Since 1844 he's been doing that in heaven. Now there's one thing unique about Bible prophecy. When God prophesies something, it is to be believed and until it happens in the world, until it's manifest in the world. Then we call it the fulfillment, right? We see the fulfillment in our eyes. This is the basic tenet of historicism. We read the prophecies, we take heed to their message, and we look for the visible fulfillment of those prophecies. Thereby we know we have a sure word of prophecy, that we've correctly understood the prophecy, and that it has been fulfilled. <clears throat> now, if there's any question as to that fulfillment, then we can have no confidence that it, that it has been fulfilled, correct? We have not witnessed it with our eyes. Well, no one has witnessed this so-called investigative judgment of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And no one can be convinced of its fulfillment. Well, that's because it's actually visibly going to be fulfilled when Christ returns, his visible return. So I've got one big beef with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There's no such thing as the investigative judgment. The investigative judgment was just a patch that the Seventh-day Adventists put upon their teaching and doctrine. They made a foolish mistake, much like the futurists do even today, they made a foolish mistake, and instead of re repenting of that mistake and correcting their error, they simply said, well, Jesus is doing a secret investigative judgment. He did come in 1844, just like we predicted. The fact of the matter is, they were simply wrong. And I plead with my Seventh-day Adventist friends to repent. Just simply repent, and God will receive you. All right? I, I, I hold so much in common with the Seventh-day Adventists simply because they're correct about so many things, which I believe basically, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm told that I make too much of this, but I agree with them on the Seventh-day Sabbath. Okay, that puts me in an extreme minority in the world, but I have a controversy with the Seventh-day Adventists and their hold to Ellen G. White as though she were some kind of a prophet. I don't agree. And this is one main reason why. In 1844, Jesus did not come as he was predicted to come by the, by the Millerite group. And because he didn't come, the two groups split up. And the Seventh-day Adventists maintain that he did come, but he's just involved secretly and invisibly in this investigative judgment. That's not true. It's simply not true. Now let's let's get on with it, shall we? Look, look. I'm not picking on the Seventh Day Adventists. I started out this broadcast admitting that I had fallen for the futurist lies. Was a futurist most of my life, and I've repented. That's all it takes. God is anxious to to forgive us our sins if we'll only repent and turn away from our error. And because I was willing to admit the error of futurism, God has given me truth. I want the same thing for the Seventh-day Adventists that I receive for myself from the, from the Lord. Okay, all of the, the fringe Protestant groups need to get together around the Scriptures and believe what it says instead of what they've been preaching from the pulpits. Okay, that's how we'll have the true ecumenical movement, see? 
That's how we come together in truth, in faith. That's how we be united. As Jesus prayed, that we all be united as one. As, even as Christ is one with the Father, we should be one in Him. And only the Scripture is going to correct us. And if we allow all these false predictions and false teachings to continue, there will be division, and only division, until Christ comes, shall he return and find us all bickering and fighting amongst ourselves? Or shall we? Shall he return and find us all united in the scriptural, biblical, historical, and prophetic truth? That's the admonition to futurists, to Seventh-day Adventists, to, to Jehovah's Witnesses, and all of them. But we will not be united with the Roman Catholic Church. There is no unity of the truth with the abomination of Rome, the counterfeit church, the counter-reformation church, the antichrist church. There's no unity or peace with Rome. No negotiation, no tolerance with Rome. We have the truth on one side, the lies on the other. And never the two shall mix. This ecumenical movement is a diabolical deception of, Christ, uh, of Antichrist in Rome, and it has deceived the whole Christian world. Now it's time for the elect to get on their faces in sackcloth and ash, repent of their sins, and return to the historical truth. Okay, that includes my dear Seventh-day Adventist friends. The author continues... The basis for many of the false predictions have been things such as, quote, the measurements between various points inside the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. Remember the time after 1844 when the Seventh-day Adventists made their grave mistake? I remember, if you're old enough, if you're as old as me, and you remember back in the 70s and 80s, it was made a great big deal about the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt and how you could dissect the, the pyramid and look at all the interior passages and make measurements from one point to another within these passages, and you see Bible prophecy predicted in stone. Okay? I remember all that gobbledygook, and I read all that stuff. Never comprehended where they came up with it, but there were there were great followings behind this this pyramid worship in Egypt. And continues, he said, the religious, social, economical, political signs of the times, and uh, the word generation used by our Lord in Matthew 24, verse 34 the date of May 14, 1948, uh, which was established as the modern, uh, which was the establishment of the modern nation state of Israel, etc. <clears throat> so 1844 brought us the Millerite movement. We have, following that, the great interest in the pyramids of Giza, and you just know that many Christians... Uh, left their churches to join Freemasonry because Freemasonry is all preoccupied with the pyramid in Egypt and all. And, uh, of course, we have in 1948 the establishment of the uh, modern nation state of Israel. That, too, was believed falsely to be a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Look, uh, it was God who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple through his Roman servants for their apostasy, for rejecting Christ, for crucifying him. Okay, he scattered those people. He put an end to their sacrifices and oblations. Okay, he made reconciliation for iniquity. He brought in everlasting righteousness. He fulfilled Daniel's prophecy, yet the Jews rejected him. Why in the world would God reinstitute a modern nation state of Israel? to allow them to build a temple and begin animal sacrifices again. It's a lie, and it all comes from Rome. It's all to prop up the future phony 70th week of Daniel, and the whole Christian world believes it's God's fulfillment of prophecy. Why don't we return to the historicist truth? We'll be back right after this.
Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. If you'd like to get a copy of this program, you may subscribe at FirstAmendmentRadio.com for only $45 a month, and you'll receive an MP3 CD weekly of all of our programs. As a bonus, we'll send you a password for our audio archives online. That's a $15 value. Or you may request any month of any program on one MP3 CD for a minimum donation of only $25, or any single program on tape, MP3 CD, or CD for only $15. You may do all of this online at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Just follow the instructions to make a donation or subscribe. You may also adopt an hour of your favorite program. Please don't forget that most of the programs on FirstAmendmentRadio.com are listener-supported. Don't do Internet? Then call 559-781-3773 and we'll be honored to help you. Thank you from all of us here at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio, who pays the bills. Now, newly formed is a tab on the website, I think on First Amendment Radio, and also on my website, a tab where you can uh, make financial contributions yourself, personally. I've never solicited funds on this program. I don't want to make it a big deal. What I, what I covet most from my listeners, as I've said so many times before, is prayer. The prayers of a righteous man availeth much. The prayers of a righteous man availeth more than money can buy. I trust the Lord, and I need help from the Lord. I need your prayers in my behalf for my health. Protect my wife and I from any further persecution. Nonetheless, we know the righteous are persecuted in this world. God grant us grace to take it gracefully. Expect it. Prepare for it. Uh, ask the Lord's blessing. Now, I want to return, before I continue, I want to return back to uh, our discussion of 1844. Just to broaden your understanding and the source of these errors. Look, uh, 1844 is before my time. I never knew the Millerites. I knew they had a heart for God. They sought truth from the Scriptures, but look, they were deceived, and I know who deceived them. Along about this same time, with the creation of the Millerites, the formation of the Millerites, which fragmented into the Seventh-day Adventists and the Jehovah's Witnesses, was... Uh, a busybody, a Jesuit busybody by the name of Peter de Smet. Okay? I believe if we research the history of the Millerite movement, we will find direct influence by that Jesuit priest, Peter de Smet. And also, along about this time, was the creation of uh, the Mormons. And the common denominator with the Mormons is also influenced by Peter de Schmidt. So, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Mormons, all need to get together and scratch their heads and find out what Peter de Schmidt was all about. And come to the knowledge of the truth. The biblical truth Put away all of your extra-biblical books that are left behind to deceive you. 
Come out and worship Christ and Him alone. Don't be a victim of the Jesuits as I was for the most of my life in my embracing of futurism. I count my futurist beliefs to be no less in error as those of, Jes of, 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 of uh, the Seventh-day Adventists or the, or the Jehovah's Witness or the Mormons. You'll find out how the Jesuits deceived those groups. They put away Peter Dismatch Jesuitism and put away his lies, his false prophecies, simply return to the King James Version of the Bible and take correction from God and his apostles. That's the answer for all those in apostasy today, including myself, return to the Scriptures, the historical, biblical, and prophetic truth. And uh, for those who won't respond to the truth, the judgment of Almighty God is at hand, and uh, he will execute judgment on all, all them that know not God. Peter Dismet was not a god, nor was he a vicar of God. He was a Jesuit designed to destroy and to deceive and to dupe God's people. Was master at his craft. Now, I'll continue. In eight and rather 1987, there was one brave rapture teacher, that means a futurist, that was bold enough to publicly proclaim the date of the rapture as May 14th, 18, or rather 1988. Now, I know who this is. I was a futurist in 1988, and I believed every futurist cockamamie lie that came down the pike. And so did all my family. This man's name was Wisenant. Okay? I forget his first name. I think it was Charles Wisenant, but I could be mistaken. But in, in, eight, in 1988, he wrote a little booklet entitled 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Return in 1988. And his thesis was that the Jewish state, which was created in 1948, 40 years later, Christ would return, okay? Despite what the Scripture says, you shall not know the day or the hour. Wise Nat, thinking himself a sage, was duped into believing that 40 years after the, the creation of the modern nation state of Israel, Jesus would return. And this is typical of, for, of futurists. Wise Nat was no different than any of the other futurists if you pin them down, if you work at it and pin them down, and sometimes you have to work hard at it, eventually they'll tell you precisely when Jesus will return. Now, Wise Nat was convinced that 40 years of testing and tempting of Israel and, uh, and Jesus would return. So, so 1848, the, uh, 1948, the establishment of the modern nation state of Israel was the the, time, the starting of the time clock, and 40 years later, Christ will return. The other segment of the futurist world believes that when the temple is rebuilt, animal sacrifices are suspended, then the, the Antichrist will, will stand up a statue in the, in the so-called temple, and then 1260 days later, Jesus will return. Pick one. They're both errors. You can believe in it, either one you want. So say the Jesuits, they don't care which error you believe in as long as you believe in error. But despite the clear language of the Scripture, futurists all believe that they can predict precisely the timing of coming of Messiah when the Scripture plainly says you cannot. All right? Only the Father knows. But wise Nance, being a wiseacre, just like his other futurist comrades in the world, myself included at the time, was predicting Christ's return in 1988. And it deceived all my family. We made dupes of ourselves. We all started our own little church, a little run-down house next to a railroad track. And we got together every Sunday to have communion and to pray that we all be found worthy. All right? May 14, 1988 came and went. 
and we were all just spinning on our heels. Were we left behind? Nobody visibly saw Jesus return. You know what happens when somebody predicts the literal return of Jesus Christ and it's only days, weeks, months, or years ahead of time? You know what happens to young people? They want to get married. They want to have sex. They want to have children. They want to start families. They want to live their life. They buy everything their hearts desire. They spend all of their income just to have a few toys to enjoy until Jesus comes. They don't pay their debts. They literally become useless, worthless in society. Thought with my own eyes. I know what happens when somebody falsely re predicts the return of Jesus Christ. I've seen with my own eyes what the godly do. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow Jesus comes. That's what happens. No holiness except coming to church every Sunday to have communion and pray and speak in tongues and assure yourself that you're going to be one that's going to be raptured out and taken away. Then go home and spend all your money on useless toys. Get together with your girlfriend and do that which you swore that you would save until marriage. It's just chaos. Rips families apart. It was a mess. Jesus didn't come in 1988. Wisenant was wrong. Just as all the futurists are wrong. Just like I was wrong. We were made fools by the Jesuits. And we taught their foolishness in the churches. You see why if I live to be a million years, I'll never live it down. God grant the same repentance that he granted to me to all of my family. All of them. Every last one. Satan has deceived the very elect. We have nothing about which to boast. Humility, that's what God gave us in all those mistakes. A proper concept of our sinful, fallen flesh. Now, I have no faith in my flesh. I have no faith in mankind at all. And I particularly have no faith in the false prophets behind the pulpits of the churches today. They continue these futurist lies. I have only grateful thanks for my Father who delivered me from the clutches of futurism. I pray for the same, I pray for the same liberty repentance and humility that God granted me for all of my family and everyone else who has fallen victim to Jesuit lies. Just as Adam and Eve were made fools in the Garden of Eden, so has Satan made fools of us today. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, or shall we stand up boldly to tell the truth, the historicist truth? I think my choice is evident. And I patiently wait for the same repentance to come to the rest of my family and the rest of the futurist world. All right, in 1987, there was one brave rapture teacher that was bold enough to publicly proclaim the date of the rapture as May 14, 1988. He based his predictions upon the 40th anniversary of the modern Zionist state which he so rashly proclaimed as the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. It wasn't the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. God's not behind the formation of the modern Zionist state of Israel. Rome is. The Antichrist is. All right. There was a later prediction of September of 1988 Needless to say, both predictions failed. Yes, Wisenant, just like the Seventh-day Adventists, was humiliated and embarrassed to realize that May 14th was not the date of the return of Jesus. So he postponed his return until September that same year. 
that was his investigative judgment. Right? Jesus didn't come in September either. Embarrassed the second time. Just like the Seventh-day Adventists. We can't see this, the, the investigative judgment. There's no one who can attest that that prophecy is fulfilled because it's not in the Bible. The Bible speaks of a literal, visible, audible return of Jesus Christ to not to rapture the saints, but to destroy the wicked. All right. See all of the errors. See how Rome defeats us. What's her purpose? To take the truth out of the world so that nothing but lies will be believed. This is all part and parcel of the counter-reformation. And Rome is marvelous at her craft. It's no wonder that John the Revelator, when he saw the Roman Catholic Church in this vision, the, the beast, this woman of Revelation chapter 17, he wondered with great admiration. You have to admire the, the, the subtlety, the complexity, the miraculous power of deception of the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuit order. It is a marvel to comprehend it. Needless to say, both predictions failed. To my knowledge, the latest date that has been predicted by one of the most publicly acclaimed prophecy quote-unquote experts is 2007 to 2012. At least he's smart enough to give a five-year window of escape. I'm not sure who this is, but I think he's speaking of Harold Camping. Nonetheless, there has been just one deception following another, and Rome is just laughing her diabolical antichrist butt off. Okay? Isn't it time we stop the papacy and the Jesuits from making fools of us? And what should we rely upon and hold fast to but the Bible? The King James Bible, rightly dividing the word of truth. Putting the cart before the horse is the wrong way to do things. We have to rightly divide the word of truth. We find Daniel's prophecy perfectly and completely fulfilled 2,000 years ago. And if we continue to believe in a future fulfillment of it, we will be deceived. And the proof is everything that's come out of the Protestant world, all these cockamamie lies, all these false predictions. And they're all a result of believing in futurism. They all find their root in futurism, the Counter-Reformation. We have to finally come to grips with the fact that all true Bible believers throughout history were historicists in their understanding. Okay? People accuse me of being the revelator of some new truth. No, not at all. There's nothing new knew about what comes forward on Inquisition Update. It's the old path. It's the old path. All the modernist lies, all the futurist lies, are the new thing. They're brand spanking new, only beginning in the early 1800s. All true Bible-believing Christians throughout history were historicists in their belief. I'm not coming up with anything new. I'm just rehearsing the old path. We need to return to the truth. It existed before all the lies. If the truth were not the truth, Satan wouldn't have to use these lies to deceive us. What is the object of all these lies? To destroy the historicist understanding. 
It's just common sense. Okay? There's nothing revolutionary about Inquisition Update. There's nothing new about Inquisition Update. It's all old. But it's the truth. Haven't we seen enough of these lies to deduce with certainty that we should search history to find the truth? Since modernism has, has brought us nothing but lies, made fools of us all, the admonition of the Lord to God's people today is the same admonition He had to the Israelites. We've turned to the old path. And the old path for us is historicism. It makes perfect scriptural sense. It makes perfect prophetic sense. It makes perfect common sense. And only when we return to, to historicism will all these embarrassments these false predictions come to an end. If as long as we remain futurist in our understanding, the Jesuits can foist any lie they want to upon us. But if we restore historicism and view in history the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, particularly and most importantly, Daniel's 70th week, having been perfectly and completely fulfilled by Jesus 2,000 years ago, it's nigh unto impossible for the Jesuits to deceive us any longer. Futurism, the greatest lie since the Garden of Eden, the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, has been punctuated by lie after lie after lie. One, be, one lie begets another. We all know this. One lie begets another. And the biggest lie begets the most lies. The root and cause of all the deception in the world today is because we simply will not let go of the master lie. Futurism. Some of my listeners are getting it. Some are hearing it for the first time. For those, I have to repeat myself over and over and over until it begins to sink in. Let me tell you, coming from coming out of futurism is far more difficult than going into it. That's why I stay at the microphone every day. It's going to take hard work. All right, Wisenant was wrong. The Seventh-day Adventists were wrong. The Millerites were wrong. The Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong. And we can expect them to continue one error after another until they return to historicism. Until they seek out and root out all the Jesuit lies that have infiltrated the Protestant churches. We will continue to be deceived. Okay? We have to e examine ourselves, what we believe. We have to examine the Scriptures. What do they say? We have to put them in the proper order. We have to see when Bible prophecy was, pr was prophesied and how it was historically fulfilled. Manifest fulfillment in the world. Manifest to our eyes. And once we begin to root out all the error, we put in all the truth and put it in its proper order. The Jesuits are rendered helpless and hopeless to deceive us any further. Until then, we're just putty in their hands. Until we return to historicism, we are putty in the Jesuits' hands. And they can mold us and fashion us into any monstrosity they want to for their own amusement. You want to defeat the Jesuits? Simply return to the historicist truth. That's how you defeat the enemy. Not with guns and knives and politics and all that, all the nonsense. You defeat Satan the same way Jesus did with the Scriptures. Put Satan to flight simply by uttering the truth. 
All right. Vain speculations have also been a tragic result in the wake of futurism's captivating influence. For many years, futurist teachers have attempted to identify who the Antichrist would be. See the error right there? Everybody's trying to predict who the Antichrist will be. Who are the who is the Antichrist, my listeners? It's the papacy. Every Pope in succession, from the first to the last, every generation has had their Antichrist, their man of sin their son of perdition, the one who deceives the nations, the one who rules over the kings of the earth, the one who controls governments, the one who controls commerce, the one who even now controls the churches, the one who has persecuted the saints of the Most High. Every generation throughout the entire unfolding of the Christian era has had its antichrists. But the whole futurist world is trying to predict who this coming Antichrist will be. See how, how desperately deceived we are? He says, for many years, futurist teachers have attempted to identify who the Antichrist would be. You know, that's the purpose of all the big, fancy prophecy conferences all over the Christian world. They all get together to try to predict who the Antichrist will be. What do you think would happen if you walked into one of these big prophecy conferences and you started spouting historicism? But the papacy is the man of sin. The papacy is the Antichrist. The office of the papacy has been with us all along. Why are you fools talking about a future Antichrist when he's devastated the Christian world for nigh on 1,500 years? You'd be pitched out on your keister. Just like you'd be pitched out of your keister of your church if you started to tell the historicist truth. But why not? Why suffer the bruises? Why not just come out on your own and be free to tell the truth to anybody who will listen? That's what I do on Inquisition Update every day. It doesn't make me popular, it doesn't make me famous, and it doesn't make me rich. I receive nothing but persecution, but it's worth it. I have treasure stored up in heaven. I'll see you tomorrow. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossTheBorder.org.